the drive to survive. It literally shapes a species through genetic mutations that, over generations, help keep a competitive edge. Better traits for hunting, reproduction, or defense. But what about humans? What's the secret to our success? The body of a modern human is not really particularly good at anything. It's a sort of a jack of all trades, but a master of none in. And that, I think, is the secret. It turns out natural selection may be a bit more nuanced than we originally thought. New research reveals it may be our ability to adapt that put Homo sapiens on top of our family tree. Competition is huge in the human. We are adapted for survivability based on competition. Humans are everywhere. We found a way to make life habitable in just about every corner of the globe. From the brutal cold of the Arctic to the sweltering heat of the desert and the suffocating humidity of the tropics. Much of this we owe to our physical design, one that proves bigger may not always be better. Take our closest extinct human relatives, the Neanderthals. They lived in Eurasia for more than 200,000 years, up until about 30,000 years ago. Their short-limbed, heavy build was an evolutionary adaptation best suited for the Ice Age, which helped to conserve body heat. But it demanded an extremely high-calorie diet, which likely contributed to their downfall when the climate rapidly changed and food became more scarce. Neanderthals seem to be over-engineered compared to a modern human. The reason that modern humans survived because they lived alongside Neanderthals and Neanderthals didn't is probably because modern humans could get by with less energy at times when there wasn't much energy available. So strength isn't everything if it costs you more energy than you can obtain. Modern humans may have had another big advantage over their Neanderthal cousins, our ability to run long distances. While humans are average sprinters compared to other animals, biologists believe endurance running played a crucial role in our evolution and in creating our upright physique. We have adapted our upper body to be bipeds. We have large scapula or shoulder blades to stabilize the core trunk and arms. We have enhanced vibratory sensation in the semicircular canals of our ears. We have a vestibulo ocular reflex in our eyes to tell us when our head position is upright and to right ourselves on uneven terrain. So we are the masters of the upright gait and we can drink and eat on the run. So what's the farthest a human can run without stopping? In 2005, American ultramarathon runner Dean Karnazes ran 350 miles across Northern California without even stopping to sleep or eat. The current record for a female is 311 miles. I think there's a limit to what the human body can tolerate in, in distance running if we don't replenish our needs on the go. So I think we can run way further than we've even run now. We need to optimize the equipment, the nutrition, and we need to have control of our internal climate. It's called homeostasis, maintaining the self both metabolically and ergonomically. Overheating is a problem for many species, but over time, humans acquired unique physical adaptations to rid excess heat, including the loss of thick body hair and a superb ability to sweat. We are fabulous sweaters. Sweating, a dilute sweat, gets rid of heat, and we're able to replenish both glucose, which is our fuel, and water while we're still moving. Not many other creatures can do that. But sweating only takes us so far. Most humans will suffer hyperthermia, a dangerously elevated body temperature, after just 10 minutes in brutally humid 140 degree heat. 
So if you don't get rid of heat, our cell membrane starts to have problems in the muscle cell. And it starts to be leaky. And toxins don't want to go across the membrane and get out and be wasted. So we build up a lot of dangerous things, potassium, breakdown of myoglobin. And that leads to kidney injury, muscle protein breakdown, and we can't regulate heat and the body quickly becomes hyperthermic, which leads to brain injury, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Some body types are better suited to withstand the heat. The Maasai tribe in East Africa is tall and slender with long limbs. All that extra surface area helps their bodies lose heat more quickly to the environment. But in cold climes like Siberia or Canada's Great White North, humans evolved to have stockier frames and shorter limbs to better conserve heat. And when exposure to frigid temperatures is extreme and long-lasting, the shivering reflex is triggered and a person's resting metabolism ramps up to produce more heat. But if our internal body temperature drops too low, hypothermia can set in quickly. We don't want to be anywhere near 89 or below. That's when we're in some serious critical circumstances and we need hospital rewarming. Cold temperatures are just one of the threats posed at high altitude. The average human body needs to adjust slowly to the lower air pressure and lack of oxygen as elevation increases. At high altitude, our pulse rate and blood pressure rise sharply as our hearts pump harder to get more oxygen to our cells. We like a rich oxygen environment, so we can perform at altitude if we take the oxygen that we do get down through our nose, down into the lungs, into the alveoli, and then the blood vessel is going by. If we can pull more oxygen into the blood vessel, then we can function with a little less oxygen available to us in our environment. And that's called acclimatization. Altitude sickness can strike at elevations as low as 8,000 feet. Symptoms include headaches, lack of appetite, vomiting, impaired thinking, and difficulty sleeping. In more extreme cases, fluid accumulates in the heart and brain, eventually leading to lung and heart failure. So what's the highest altitude humans can survive without supplemental oxygen? While climbers have summited Mount Everest without oxygen, over 29,000 feet, the highest permanent human settlement is La Rinconada, Peru, where over 50,000 people live at an altitude of 16,732 feet. Some human populations who live at high altitudes have adapted to the environment through genetic mutations. There are some genes which allow modern humans to extract oxygen more effectively. That ability, I suspect, was available to modern humans pretty early. In 2010, researchers made an intriguing discovery in Tibet. They found that 88% of Tibetans have a mutation in a gene called EPAS1, which allows them to survive in air with 40% less oxygen than normal. The origin of this unusual mutation came from an even more unusual source, a long extinct group of humans called the Denisovans who lived more than 41,000 years ago. No other group of modern humans has this genetic trait. The discovery adds to the growing picture of human evolution and may hold the key to our survival as a species. Our remarkable ability to adapt to fluctuations in the environment may in fact stem from our ancient, long-extinct cousins. The question now is whether we'll be able to continue evolving and adapting in the face of a new round of potentially devastating climate change. And what's happened in human evolution is that the, the cultural evolution, which is using our head to solve problems, is now the way we solve most problems. We don't solve most problems by evolving in terms of our, our bodies, but we are not evolving at the rate that we were earlier on in our evolutionary history, because we don't have to. And that's the secret to our success.